Okay, you guys, we have critical mass now, so I think we'll get started. <laughs> we have, there, there are 10 people in the room this morning, so thank you all. Great to see you guys. And there are thousands on Champions TV, I know it. Um, but good morning, everyone, and good afternoon and good evening to those of you who are not here on Central Standard Time in the United States. Um, welcome to the Global Innovator Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Catherine Gunsbury, and I'm the Director of Corporate Social Responsibility. We are so excited to bring you the speaker series, which is a five-week series that features uh, Ashoka Fellows. Um, Ashoka is an international nonprofit organization who sponsors social innovators. Um, these individuals will share their stories and have shared their stories and solutions with our employees in this exclusive webinar series. Um, you will hear from and you have heard from folks who are working in the fields of sustainability, health, economic development, and education. And we hope that this inspires you to think about new ways of solving old problems. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Spectra Myers, who's going to moderate today's conversation. She's a change manager with Ashoka. She joined Ashoka in 2007 to work locally with area schools, businesses, the media, and nonprofit organizations to create local and global impact by sharing insights from the Ashoka network. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Spectra. And um, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Um, just a pleasure to be back and to see uh, new faces as well as some of the folks who've joined us for past uh, webinars. Again, my name is Spectra, the moderator for our series. Um, I really want to thank the General Mills Foundation and additionally Catherine uh, from CSR, who's been a big champion for this series. Uh, without this, we wouldn't have the opportunity to share our work nor the work of our fellows with all of you. I'll begin with just a very short overview of Ashoka for those of you who are joining us for the first time, and then we'll start our interview with our guest Ashoka fellow, Marta Ekavaria. Uh, we'll do a brief interview with Marta, and then we'll open it up for questions from the room as well as uh, for those of you who are joining from Champions TV today. Uh, for those joining on Champions TV, on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a submit a question button. Uh, please feel free to add your voice to the conversation. So, for those of you that are new to us, Ashoka is an organization that is focused on changing systems. We develop local networks, national networks, and global networks to scour the earth for social entrepreneurs. These are folks with innovative solutions to challenging issues across fields. We call these folks Ashoka Fellows, and they are disruptors in their field, helping us see uh, a new way to do business, a new way to solve problems. Well-known fellows include Mohammed Yunus, the Nobel Prize-winning founder of the Grameen Bank, Jimmy Wales, founder of Wikipedia, and Steve Rothschild locally, a former General Mills employee and founder of Twin Cities Rise. He's building new finance models for successful nonprofits, uh, and we love working with him. The second thing we do is we work with our fellows, and we've got about 3,000 of them in 70 countries, to find patterns uh, in their work and to work with our partners and with our fellows to accelerate those patterns whether it's in health, education, or environmental sustainability. One pattern that I'd like to highlight that might be relevant to many of you is some of our work with companies. Um, in the last three decades, the citizen sector, which is the term Ashoka uses to talk about the nonprofit sector, has become very competitive and entrepreneurial. And we've closed in many ways the pro productivity, scale, and globalization gaps. As a result, the two systems, the citizen sector and the business sector, can now collaborate in new ways very profitably uh, to provide more social value and economic value. We call this hybrid value chains. And in 2012, Ashoka won the Harvard Business Review and the McKinsey and Company Global Competition for Management Innovation for our work demonstrating how these hybrid value chains can work in different industries and seven sites on four continents. This is just one example of the way that Ashoka can work with businesses here in the United States and around the world. It's just been a pleasure getting to know all of you, and we hope to find many more ways to collaborate. If you'd like to learn more about Ashoka's work, visit ashoka.org or connect with us through the General Mills Your Cause platform. It's now my pleasure to introduce Marka Ekovaria, the founding director of EcoDecision. EcoDecision is a social enterprise dedicated to finance conservation of natural landscapes. As a Colombian national currently living in Ecuador, Marta has specialized in protecting Andean ecosystems that are incredible sources of abundant and clean water to sustain regional economies and livelihoods. As an environmental manager, 
Marta has a long history of working with the private and public institutions to establish institutional and financial mechanisms to protect nature and in particular water sources in Latin America. She is currently working with the Ministry of Environment in Peru to incentivize the implementation of a watershed investment in different parts of the country. She's a member of various non-governmental organizations and involved in environmental conflict resolution throughout the region. It's a pleasure to have Marta joining us today. So Marta, Thank you. <laughs> why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work. Well, I'm Marta Chavarria, as you said, and I am originally from Colombia. And I live in Ecuador, where I've set up this company, Ecodecision. And our specialty has been really trying to demonstrate that ecosystem service solutions are more cost effective than, um, you know, built infrastructure. And so in my field, which is more predominantly water protection, um, it's been shown at many levels that the most important and sort of most cost effective solution is to protect the water sources rather than restore or clean up. And that's our aim, and we're working in different sites and with different um, uh, stakeholders. So Ashoka Fellows are pretty adept at seeing how a system could shift. Now, for those of us who aren't so familiar with watersheds and water resources, can you kind of give us the lay of the land, what you were seeing and what you, where you saw that opportunity? Well, my background was environmental manager. I actually started my college career as computer science major. <laughs> But uh, since I was in a very liberal place, I was able to change. And suddenly, as a Colombian national, you realize that the whole focus on economic growth suddenly had a, a gap. You know, there was no discussion about environmental management when I went to college at all. Now we have the whole field of sustainable development or sustainability questions. But at the time, really, it was an externality. And the environment has always been perceived as an externality. And water is a perfect example of that. And for some reason, not only do I love water at many levels, I'm a diver, a surfer, I mean, I love water, but it also is um, um, a major basic um, element of our existence because we need it every day. And we actually really mistreat it every day, all of you, uh, all of us, um, because it's been so abundant and we think it's so... Um, you know, uh, available, um, we don't really think about how much to take care of it. Only maybe in very extreme conditions such as Africa and maybe, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, do they really realize the value? But most of us really mistreat it. And so it became evident to me in my work, both as an undergraduate and then my graduate work, that, you know, water is still a very mismanaged resource. We really need to change the economics of water at many levels. But we also need to change our behavior at the industry level, at the you know, agricultural level, at the personal level, um, to make sure that we use it most effectively. And a basic example is we flush water down the toilet and we pollute it every time we go to the bathroom. And so managing feces through water is really illogical. You know, that's an example of the things how we need to change technology, we need to change culture. So my work all of a sudden started saying, you know, this is a question that's very important. When you think about how water is managed right now, most of the investment, and even though there's a huge investment gap, most of the investment goes to protecting maybe, you know, providing water to the users, but nobody thinks about the upstream. So that's been my focus, and it's finding ways, innovative ways to ensure that we can channel some resources to those sites which usually are high biodiverse and high, bio, you know, cultural, high value culturally, because it's the poorest of the poor that are usually in these settings. So we can improve livelihoods as well as protect nature by investing up in the watershed or in the water resources where most of us get our drinking water from. Well, you're talking to folks from the land of 10,000 lakes. So, you know, we are blessed with a lot of water uh, here and, and often are thinking about agriculture and farms and, and how do we conserve here. Um, so you've got a receptive audience. Can you tell us exactly what you do? So you realize that water is very important. Folks aren't always able to think about how best to conserve it. Um, so what did you guys actually set up and how does it work? 
So the way that we began to deal with this question is I was working with the sugar industry of Colombia. It's a setting in the southern part of the country where there's large scale sugar production, sugarcane production, and they were all very concerned about their water resources. And we were able to identify because of the leadership of one particular ex-minister of agriculture that in the law in Colombia existed this mechanism of water, water users associations. Basically, it's a way to bring together the water users. They provide some specific tariff or user fee, if you want to call it, that can invest in the watershed in projects that nobody was investing. At the time, there was a local, you know, um, regional authority, environmental authority, that had the management plans, which you all probably have heard. There's tons of watershed management plans everywhere. But a lot of times they're not implemented because the resources are not there or the source of financing are not there. And there's also usually not enough stakeholders demanding that these things get implemented um, and follow up and, you know, lead and, and ensure that things continue over time. So we set up these watershed associations. There's around 13 of them, which focus on one, each individual sub-watershed that feeds the Cauca Valley River. Um, and eventually, you know, it involves the landowners down below that have the larger scale production and have the resources, and they're willing to invest in activities up in the watershed so that the um, local communities can um, in solve certain problems, such as, you know, um, the reforestation, maybe protection of the riversides, maybe certain engineering um, solutions that need to be done because of landslides, or maybe even social programs, um, whether it's educational or training and capacity building that those communities need to be sure that they have alternatives to gain, um, you know, live for their livelihoods, to gain um, income. So over time, these mechanisms, which have sort of extended um, in different uh, iterations, if you will, um, now I've been involved in what we call watershed trust funds, which is basically a financial um, trust fund that uh, captures resources from the users and invests in management, whether it's the protection of a protected area, like a national park, which usually doesn't have resources to be funded, the reforestation that I mentioned, and all the different activities that you need to ensure that you're protecting the water source. And the interesting thing about this is that usually they're high-valued um, areas ecologically as well as socially, so it ensures that we're channeling some resources back into areas that receive very little investment. Currently, I'm doing the same in Peru. Um, an example is the Aqua Fund in Lima. Um, it's a fund that is just being set up, and it's very much at the beginning stage, even though it's been set up in 2009, it's involving industry, involving all the users of a watershed called the Remac watershed, which is, I would say, probably one of the most affected and polluted watersheds in the world because it feeds the city of Lima, the second largest city in the desert. Um, and it very much receives pollution from mining, from industry, from agriculture, from the communities upstream that do not treat their wastewater, um, and it's, you know, heavily impacted because it's lost a lot of its natural cover. So we're trying to put together through this fund, you know, which brings together right now private entities, from, some from the social sector and some industry, to invest in measures that can ensure the viability of the watershed. Um, over time, we hope to bring the water user, which in the case of Peru, is the major water company for Lima, Sedapal. And so we hope that little by little, you build an alliance, public-private alliance, that can over, over time implement both things that are regulated and also voluntary measures to protect the watershed. So can you talk a little bit about how these groups come together? Is it voluntary? Are they required? How do they decide what projects get funded upstream? Well, usually these folks come together because of the leadership of someone. So, for example, in the case of Peru, I was invited by an NGO that had been working locally in a management plan for the green areas of Lima, and they wanted to set up a fund. 
So the founder, which is another Ashoka fellow, Anna Suketi, invited me when she found out about the mechanism and said, let's set up a fund for Lima. So now that has been set up, that has begun, and it begins to say, okay, so what is the plan? What do we think is the important thing? And in the case of Lima, it's very much linked to a process of a watershed council, a user's, if you will, council, which is actually regulated in the law. There's a new water law in Peru that creates these councils. And what we're ensuring is that the water trust fund can be a source to catalyze and strengthen the council. Because a lot of times these councils, as I mentioned before, don't have the resources or the leadership to get things done over time. So we're trying to sort of bring together the two, a voluntary mechanism like the Water Trust Fund with the sort of regulated watershed council um, where people can come together, people can make decisions, and then they build the management plan together in a very participatory way and um, begin to set up their goals. In institutional settings like Latin America and the developing world where regulation is weak, the voluntary space can be a very rich place to innovate and create. Over time, these things should be regulated. But we've seen that even in very you know, regulated spaces like the U.S., there's still the difficulty of ensuring multi-sector stakeholder participation. So, you know, deep down, leadership is key, commitment. So for all of you as, you know, General Mills employees in your work where water is so important for an industry like your own, that leadership is key. So some folks in the room and joining us on Champions TV are probably pretty familiar with global water issues, but not everyone might be. So can you just quickly kind of give us the big picture? And I know I've seen uh, some videos of you talking a little bit about water in a way that helps people really grasp why we should be thinking about it in the first place. I'm just going to back us up a little bit. So let's start from the very beginning. The world is all water, but unfortunately, most of it is salt water. So we only have 3% of the Earth's surface or, or volume of water available to us as fresh water. But then we get down to most of that is frozen. And unfortunately, it's also melting currently. <laughs> but, you know, the small percentage of fresh water that we are available, which is less than 1%, um, allows us to... to you know, begin to do everything that we need to do. And in a world of, you know, almost 8 billion people, it's a huge challenge because we haven't dealt with our wastewater. So we have a major problem of quality in the developing world, but there's also a problem of quality in the developed world um, because, unfortunately, there's other pollutants that, such as nutrients, which we haven't been able to get a handle on. So you have highly toxic or non, you know, not, not oxygenated areas like in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, in the U.S., which is um, just because of too much nutrients that are coming down. So we begin to deal with problems of quality in that small amount of, of, of water that we have available. Then we also have mismanagement. You know, for example, the largest consumer of water in the world is agriculture, where we have huge inefficiencies. Um, and, you know, we're talking about cases of 65% losses, which is huge. So we have a lot of work to do in the industry that is also very difficult to, a sector that is difficult to organize because, it, you know, agriculture is scattered. It has different levels of uh, involvement from large, large scale industries to very small scale poor producers. So we have a lot of work to do in that whole sector. Um, industry also is another actor which is a small consumer in the global scale, but is a key consumer in, at the local level because you have the resources, you have the know-how, and you probably have the regulation that you have to deal with can ensure that can maybe catalyze change and move. And particularly in my case, you know, I've been focusing on drinking water. Drinking water is a way to... Um, capture and, and entice and promote everyone because everyone is concerned about their drinking water. So I've been focusing, working mostly with the utilities and um, those sectors to involve them in these um, mechanisms, as I mentioned, the water trust funds or associations, or we're also calling them investments in watershed services, so, to make sure that they commit 
um, to uh, cleaning up the system. So those are kind of the sectors in water. And the big challenge that you should all know is that with climate change, things are shifting. Um, places where we thought were very water rich are losing um, their richness, if you will, because of problems of quality. Um, for example, in the Andean region, we will expect maybe more precipitation 